good afternoon today's talk will be the second part of my two part talk on thomas hardy's novel under the green tree as we have noted in the last talk under the green tree was thomas hardy's second novel to be published it appeared anonymously in 1872 and was the first in his great series of what came to be called the wessex novels it is a light pastoral comedy of manners as it were that is quite unlike the dark and tragic novels of his later years for which thomas hardy's reputation today largely rests the subtitle suggests both the principal subject and the tone in which it should be considered which is the melstock choir a rural painting of the dutch school Thomas Hardy was disappointed by the rejection of his first novel titled The Poor Man and the Lady at the hands of publishers Chapman and Hall to offset this for his second work Desperate Remedies 1871 he chose a popular genre the sensation novel which was full of dramatic plot devices designed to shock readers While these two failed to meet his hopes of commercial success, he decided to turn to a subject that he knew intimately and very closely, which is the life and customs of ordinary working people from rural southwest England. For his third novel, therefore, he created a fictional landscape called Wessex, and he made it entirely his own in the many novels that followed. because he chose rural settings for his work hardy was at first considered by many critics as merely a regional novelist a minor artist whose vision of life is limited by geographic boundaries but this view has since been completely overturned today and hardy is now seen as a major novelist of late 19th century almost all his important works are set in the fictional version of southwest england but they at the same time encompass issues of social class education gender identity industrialization and the psychology of individuals pitting themselves up against society and even what is often seen as some form of a cosmic destiny the geographic location of events in the wessex novels is an interesting blend of real and fictional place names some towns are given their real names for example bristol bath and southampton others are given invented names for example dorchester becomes caster bridge the isle of portland becomes the isle of fingers and dartmoor is renamed Egdon Heath it is generally accepted by the critics and uh, readers of Thomas Hardy that the events of the Melstock parish church and its square are based on the events on inside the church at Stinsford in Dorset near to where Hardy grew up in Little Brockhampton now once we go into the next part of uh, this novel which uh, would perhaps interest us as readers namely the historical theme of this particular novel or whether this novel does have an uh, have a historical import thematically now before we go into this we need to reiterate the fact that thomas hardy was very conscious that during his own lifetime many rural occupations and much traditional behavior were being swept away or replaced as it were by the arrival of new forms of transport production and ownership which was propelled significantly by the surge of the industrial revolution that was sweeping most of the urban landscape of england his novels create a record of this pastoral traditions as a form of social record and he is particularly acute in registering the details of rural economy and its effects on a wide range of characters from rural laborers to craftsmen to farmers tradesmen and even local landowners for a work as gentle thematically as under the green tree 
how it selects an appropriately minor feature of traditional social life, namely the musicians and singers of a parish church choir. Its members are all tradesmen and workers, as we see, who play a variety of stringed instruments, which they clannishly regard as the only appropriate accompaniment to both religious and secular performance. They particularly object to the introduction of clarinets, which became popular in the mid 19th century, but they are threatened by Vaika Maywood's introduction of the organ or harmonia in their surroundings. It is significant that their provision of musical accompaniment involves the sympathetic cooperation of a group of musicians, whereas the organ is placed by a single individual. Socially cohesive practices from an earlier age are being replaced gradually by individualism and the machine age devices. This is what is symbolically very accurate in uh, the sequence of the introduction of a new musical instrument uh, replacing the old. It is noteworthy that Hardy skillfully blends his two themes on this issue. Maybur, for example, could easily have been demonized as an enemy of the rustics, but in fact compromises with them over the date of introducing the organ is very, very significant to us as readers. But the person who will play it is Fancy Day, in whom he has a romantic interest. Now, with regard to the romantic theme in this particular novel, it is significant that unlike in these later and more mature novels, uh, where Hardy explored all sorts of complex issues that arise between men and women in their emotional attachment to one another. This particular novel has still not attained that level of complexity or maturity of treatment that Hardy was to be famous for. For example, with the mayor of Gastonbeck, we find Michael Henchard actually selling a wife he no longer loves, then reaping the consequences when she comes back to him years later. In Tess of the Wives, Tess murders the man who has seduced her, so she is psychologically free to run off with the man who is her lawful husband. There are no such dark issues as it were in Under the Green Tree. In this novel, Hardy explores a very innocent and simple romance between two characters who have very few psychological problems perplexing them. But the relationship does include issues that Hardy was to explore more fully or more deeply and exhaustively in his later works, specifically issues dealing with class and education. For example, in this particular novel, we get an idea or an information that Fancy's father, Geoffrey Fay, objects to dig Dewey as a suitor to his daughter on grounds of class expectations and education. Hence is the daughter of God, Geoffrey's first marriage to a well-educated woman and she has been sent to the best finishing schools, which is why she is qualified to be a school teacher. However, Mr. Day has lived at a modest level with his second wife in order to provide Fancy with a good dowry. He is hoping to attract a well-to-do middle-class husband for his daughter. Dick TV is merely the son of a man with a horse and a car haulage business. We find in the novel, in the novel that Geoffrey Day's capitulation to Fancy's self-starvation, uh, though is not act, uh, uh, altogether or uh, authentically convincing, but it does introduce the element of folk superstition uh, that Hardy was to include in many of his other novels uh, as part of the traditional beliefs and behaviors he was documenting. So essentially, what we the readers encounter as folk superstition is perhaps a deliberate ploy of Thomas Hardy to present to us issues which are being increasingly marginalized with the onset of industrialization in rural or semi-urban England. The, in the novel, the romance between Dick and Fancy runs a predictable series of ups and downs all congruent with the delicate and, in, and emotionally good-natured tenor of the plot, but the story does end on an interesting note that speaks volumes 
for what was to come in Hardy's later work. In a moment of self-indulgent weakness, we find that Fancy accepts Mabel's proposal of marriage whilst she is still engaged to dig Dewey. Mabel is the sort of suitor of whom her father would certainly approve, but then she rescinds the decision next day. Mabel, a very honourable chair, accepts her reasons and recommends that she confesses all to Dick Dewey, who he, who he predicts will be forgiving. But she does not tell her husband about the incident. And so their marriage begins with a secret between them, a secret she would never tell. Quote unquote, these are the exact words. A secret she would never tell. Now, with regard to the significance of this particular novel, we accept that although Under the Greenwood Tree is obviously very light-hearted in tone and is generally classed among Hardy's minor works compared to the major works and the complex works that come later, it has a far greater significance when viewed in the light of his later novels. First, Under the Greenwood Tree establishes basics as a fictional location which Hardy would make the setting for all his major works in the years that follow. Wessex is an area of southwest England bound by Somerset in the north, Javon, Cornwall and Hampshire and Dorsetshire in the south. His account of his dislocale in all its topographical, geographical, architectural and botanical detail is what gives his novels their compelling realism because there are examples in the novel where Hardy's accurate and brilliant description, photographic description of nature convinces us, in a sense, that Hardy was actually describing something which was at one point in time very close to his heart or close to his eyes. The issue he explores in the novel, such as the relationship between rustic country people and the content of their social and emotional lives, is something he would take to the level of high drama and even tragedy in his later works. Dick Dewey is the son of Carter, a tranter in uh, Victorian terms, but by the end of the novel he has had business cards printed with a view to becoming more successful and occupying a slightly higher social position. Michael Hinget, for example, in The Mayor of Casterbridge is similarly ambitious but after a spectacular rise, he is eventually reduced to a form of self-destruction, at the end of which he wishes to be remembered by nobody. It's quite a pathetic consequence for Hinchard in that novel. The rustics, in contrast, in Under the Greenwood Tree, are a charming set of naive, friendly and sympathetic characters, who are variations of other complex characters who would occur later in Hardy's mature novels. They are always depicted as simple, honest folk, embracing any number of folk memories, superstitions and tolerance of each other's foibles. They also embody the vehicle of everyday speech patterns, local dialect, slang and regional pronunciation that hardly was keen to recall. Interestingly, usual critical interpretation of the characters in Thomas Hardy's Under the Greenwood Tree has endeavoured to connect them to a reality located outside the text, usually in social history as rural types or in Hardy's biography as individuals the author knew personally or through reminiscence of words or records. The evocative power of this final masterpiece comes from it being a recreation of Hardy's childhood environment of the people and surroundings where he spent the most impressionable years of his life. The novel's theme, therefore essentially, points to some form of an autobiographical element which leads to an autobiographical crisis. And in this novel, as in the other novels of Hardy, there is another important clash that occurs at some level and this clash is between a gradient and semi-urban life between traditional rural culture and that of new metropolitan terraces. Wright's approach epitomizes realist criticism by assuming that the novel intends to mirror actual people 
in their historical environment and by taking as its task the discovery of how well its intention is difficult. Because he finds out that Dick Dewey and Fancy Day are no Arcadians, innocent of the facts of life and their environment, not a pastoral ideal, but a rural reality, Wright finds the characters and those themes significant and praiseworthy. The novel displays two methods of character creation. What are the two methods? The two methods are first, a seeming system of arbitrary attributes regulated by control difference. This is the first. The second is the manipulation of rhetorical figures because these processes seem not to depend upon any reality other than what they generate. They put in question the usefulness and uselessness of the validity of response. Now, with regard to the other process uh, of approaching Hardy's um, under the green tree, uh, the process of understanding how the character creation operates, the best place to begin is uh, the brief first chapter of this particular novel, uh, Melstock Lane. And I quote a few lines from it to give you the hint or to give you an idea as to what sort of a text that was targeted to be appropriated. Hardy says, and I quote, To dwellers in a wood, almost every species of tree has its voice as well as its feature. At the passing of the trees, the fir trees sob and moan, no less distinctly than they rock. The holy whistles as it battles with itself. The ash hisses amid its quiverings. The beech rustles while its flag bows rage, rise and fail. And winter, which modifies the note of such trees as shed their leaves, does not destroy its individuality. Although this paragraph deals with trees instead of humans, it establishes what will prove to be the novel's most conspicuous modes of characterization. A character is created by designing difference. For example, two synonyms here are individuality, distinction and specification within a class that is trees and by providing the entities produced by differentiation already legible characters, proper names such as fur, holy, beech, ash, etc. The individuality of each tree, posited by denomination, derives from its difference from other trees within various set of attributes. For example, her voice and movement are two such attributes, underlying the entire operation in the figure of personification, which is achieved by giving human characteristics, sobbing, for example, to trees. The figure is reversed in the second paragraph where we get an idea of how conducting oneself during Christmas or Christmas Eve is that significant. He says, on a cold and steady Christmas Eve within living memory, a man was passing up a lane towards Melstock Cross in the darkness of a plantation that whispered thus distinctively to his intelligence. What was the whisper? All the evidences of his nature were those afforded by the spirit of its footsteps which succeeded each other lightly and quickly, and by the liveliness of his voice, he sang in a rural cadence. For example, the three famous lines of the song reads like this, with the rose and the lily, and the daffodown lily, the lads and the lasses and sheep sharing go. The reciprocal definition of human and tree in the first two paragraphs, a mixing of the natural and the human, is a species of chiasmus, a rhetorical figure whose vast potential for character creation is marked from the beginning of the novel. We also get an evidence of a folk lyric here. Deep Dewey's folk lyric, for example, the sheep shearing song, is specially chiastic because it's sung on Christmas Eve just before the choir goes rolling. It is the first instance of the novel of one of Hardy's favorite devices, that is, the juxtaposition of the sacred and the profane. 
a folk song like the Paloma song in As You Like It, a really sophisticated patron, is about human love in a natural setting. Within the song itself, mixture is the keynote, the bouquet of rose, lily, and the portman to Daffo Down Delhi pairs up with mixed humans, lads and lasses, for example, interacting with animals, like sheep, for example. This human natural jumble prefigures the plot, which will be a mix of characters culminating in the biological crossing, as it were, of Dick Daly. And fancy day. so it is appropriate that the first meeting of characters occurs at Melstock Cross. Interestingly, the creation of character established or the cre creation of character by establishing differences within the class operates throughout under the Greenwood tree. Every human character, for example, belongs to the class of humans set up by the initial paradigm, even though the paradigm is expanded to accommodate new attributes. And within the class, human, Subclasses are generated and characters established by their differences with the attributes of the subclass. Important subclasses include men, women, wives, husbands, families, dewees, leaves and pennies, days, etc., ministers, musicians and listeners. Subclasses are of course liable to branch out into, into sub-subclasses. For example, wives, a subclass of women, are said to provoke a sense of, uh, of uh, security uh, in the society because they are never more than half wrong. The creation of character by generating control systems of diffidence and rhetorical figures like personification, cynic doc, chiasmus, and prosopopoeia works well until fancy day makes her entrance, disrupting the tradition-bound male world of the male stock choir. It is tempting to interpret this disruption thematically as a binary opposition manifesting itself along class, sex and educational lines. Viewed in the wider context of all Hardy's novels, these thematic polarizations are even harder to overlook because they are so pervasive and they are, they are so pervasively spread throughout the novel. Yet, fancy's significance is never easy to determine. Even from a purely thematic point of view, fancy does not fit the pattern of old verses. And in fact, it does not fit into the pattern of new verses as well because if she is the newly educated modern woman whose organ playing replaces the traditional male choir, she is also thematized as the woman and as such embodies the old Eve bringing trouble to Eden. She also incarnates two words associated with the eternal female, the Ovidian and Romantic Nightingales. Her mixture of modernity and antiquity therefore makes her a sense of late hardy character. The modern woman, Sue Behead, who feels more ancient than medievalism. So this is all that I wanted to tell you with regard to my second talk on Thomas Hardy's Under the Green Tree.